Hi, and welcome back to the CE Drive podcast. Uh, this episode, I'm going to be discussing IPPs and RCAs with Fraser Lang. This is a good sequel to season four, episode one with Trevor Perry. And this episode will be good for life insurance credits in all jurisdictions, no Alberta ANS credits. Uh, we'll have an FP Canada financial planning credit, an IROC professional development credit, an Advocus Professional Development Credit, and an MFDA Retirement Planning Credit. So we are getting episodes approved for MFDA credits. And also we have implemented a quality assurance process now. So um, I know some of you had problems with the certificates and so forth along the way. And I really wanna hear if you're having those issues uh, because that'll help our quality assurance team to make sure that they're getting all the stuff they should be getting. Okay, uh, just do the object real quick and then we'll roll into the interview. So I uh, have a plaque that normally sits, sometimes you can see that sort of my camera set up, it sits sort of up, oops, up over here, kind of. Um, and it was my wife's plaque actually. And there she is, Sergeant Louise Abdu. She was a warrant officer, she was retired. And there's even a picture of her on this plaque. This is sort of the uh, default retirement plaque that you get when you leave service at one field ambulance, which is the sort of army um, unit here in Edmonton that provides medical support to all the units in Western Canada. And uh, this picture of her right here was kind of blurry here, but uh, it's her providing um, medical support. She was a physician assistant when she left and a medic for most of her time in the military, but that's her providing support to an Afghan child, actually. A lot of what she did in Afghanistan was that kind of thing. Um, helping people out who didn't get to see uh, doctors and that kind of thing on the regular. All right, um, let's roll into the interview. Um, there's only one term that shows up here, SDA, salary deferral arrangement, that I think is not otherwise defined. I'm going to talk about it in a future episode. I know I hate to leave you in suspense, um, but we just don't have time sort of before after this episode to cover it. So I will get it, though. Hi, I'm here today with Fraser Lang. Fraser is the head of business development at GBL, an actuarial firm based out of Calgary. He's a CFP certificate and a CLU holder and uh, joins us today to talk about, I think, IPPs and RCAs where we're going to spend most of our time. So can you chat a little bit about who you are and uh, GBL, maybe writ large, Fraser? Sure, no problem. So uh, my name is Fraser Lang. I'm the head of business development and sales for GBL. Um, I am domiciled out of Toronto, although our head office is out of Calgary. So our actuaries and our administrative department is all centered out of there, as well as our Western sales team. Um, I handle all the national accounts, as well as uh, individual advisors from Ontario right through the Maritime. So we're a little different from our peer group in the sense that, you know, when we started the uh, consulting arm just a bit over 20 years ago, we were earmarking this to use a, a mutual fund wholesaling model to the concepts we had, where you would have an outside um, relationship manager, you would have an inside salesperson, and then imagine our actuaries being like, you know, our portfolio managers would be in that sense. So we're taking the the, the technical side and trying to present it in a way that is digestible and also understanding along the way the needs of both advisors and clients. So we, we've worn those different hats in our day so we can put ourselves in the shoes of, of individuals. So when we're discussing the concepts, we're trying to touch on the points that are relatable to people rather than just some of the you know mathematical minutia. And you used to be an advisor yourself, Fraser, so you know that language. Well, I started off as an assistant, which is interesting, actually, uh, when I when I started uh, over 25 years ago in the financial services industry. So I also understand that from, you know, sometimes we get pushed back on IPPs from the admin assistant to the advisor saying, oh, I don't think we should do these. I hear they're really complicated and a lot of paperwork. So I can understand how they're feeling as well and how we can help put their fears, you know, sort of at rest and you know, once they get the first one going, it's usually a lot easier for them because there's you know set processes in place. Yeah, that makes sense. And I mean, you take care of a lot of the uh, technical heavy lifting anyways, right? Exactly. And one of the things that we've always done as well is, you know, keeping, as we say, keeping your powder dry in a sense is we bill the clients directly for the work we do. And we don't participate in any commissions derived from insurance or investments. 
And that way we're agnostic in terms of those recommendations. So, you know, if an advisor says, you know, what can you put in an IPP? And I say, well, as long as you don't have more than 10% of the market value in a single stock, you could have it in a fund, you could have it in a pool, you could have it in an ETF, um, all kinds of different structures. And I think it's important to have somebody there that doesn't have skin in the game on that side so that people are getting, you know, a, a little bit more transparency. I, you know, it is nice when you have a structure that's wrapped around something, but then it's also, you know, your limitations on on what an advisor can offer and solutions can be limited as well. So we've always made sure to keep that that wall between the two sides that we're not, um, you know, participating on the other end. Who do you see as your client then? Is the client the, like, because the advisors would be the one bringing you business, right? The, yeah. Yeah. So who who's the client here? Well, it's interesting. The way I've always viewed it is it's twofold. It's almost like having two different clients on different levels, right? I mean, as you have the, the end client, obviously, is the person that pays all of our bills and they're the person we're trying to help here. So they are the client, they are one of the clients and they're very important to us. We want to make sure it's very important to me that they understand um, the structures and, you know, we're not, we're, this isn't to us um, selling products. And I know people talk about products. I look at these as strategies, whether it fits or not. And if there's something in there that doesn't quite work, I'll, I'll be very honest about that because, uh, you know, setting up a pension plan and then having to shut it down, it's, it's a bit of a pain for everyone involved. That being said, we also understand that the advisors are the lifeblood of our business. They are usually the ones that bring prospects to our attention. And that is, you know, client acquisition is one of the hardest things you can do. So we want to make sure that they look amazing when they're dealing with these things, that we're there to help them, you know, prop up not only their knowledge, um, that they've got professionals that are backing it, but that if there's any administration issues, we have uh, an admin manager that's attached to all of their accounts. So we really make sure that there's a lot of different layers to our service. And we've really spent a lot of money through the years on reinvesting in our own CRM system that was all custom made um, and making sure that we have those layers. Because I think the mistake that sometimes people make when they commoditize something and look at you know IPPs, you know, it's like you know, looking at getting a haircut or looking at buying produce somewhere. Okay, an apple's a dollar ninety-five here and it's a dollar fifty here you look at it, it looks like the same apple, so why would I pay more? Whereas I think in the absence of value, you really have to look at what is a service offering. So DBL, for example, with IPPs, we're middle of the, of the industry in terms of the fees we charge. We're not the cheapest, we're not the most expensive. However, because we, hold, we hang our hat on the service offering side and being there for advisors and clients, and I think we used to run into situations where you say, okay, this firm is a little bit cheaper, I keep my head still. Sorry. So we were saying uh, that you you sort of build in those processes and really try to to simplify the let's say administrative side. So can you pick us up there, Fraser? Sorry. Sure. I mean, I think that it's you know we're you know we are the experts in that area, and I think it's important that you have an actuarial firm that's pri providing the guidance on it and has the different levels of service. So although I may be the outside relationship manager. Um, I have admin people that are specifically focused on what's going on with the plan in terms of registrations and funding. And we make sure that we have those different layers of service to, to assist the advisor. So if they need to find someone, you know, there's many layers they can go through. They should be able to find a live body. And I guess my advice on that is when you are researching actuaries to partner up with, I mean, obviously their breadth of knowledge is important. We all are concerned about fees to a degree, but you also want to see what is the service side? Do they have people on their team that are there? Like, is it a one man shop with an assistant or one actuary shop with an assistant? Is it, do they farm it out to a third party? And I think those are important considerations when you're choosing a relationship. I think another thing that I see from a lot, like a lot of the guests on my podcast, and I'm thinking people like uh, Mike McClenahan or Steve McEwen, are very education oriented. And I think mm -hmm. I see that from GBL too, right? Like you really work to help the advisors you deal with understand the, at least as much as they need to understand about the products they're, they're, or the services they're, they're dealing with here. Definitely. And it's interesting because when we started out and we rolled out our, our, our service offering and consulting offering 20 years ago, most of the major banks and financial companies didn't even you know 
know where to start with regards to compliance on setting these things up. And we worked very closely with the compliance departments and we worked with head offices to come up with advisor processes so that an advisor can go on the intranet of whatever firm they're with. And there's a certain amount of information there on, you know, here's what you need to do to start the process on an IPP, whether it's us or another provider. And I think education is such a huge part of what we do or what I do. I mean, um, prior to the pandemic, the number of speaking engagements I'd have where I'd be going around the country and speaking was huge. Obviously, I'm still doing them, but from a bunker rather than uh, out in, 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 the, in the regular public. So I think it's important. And, and one of the things that I believe in, and, and you know, Gordon, our, our founder, who has retired, um, four years ago. So we have Savaz Kassam, who's our president and chief actuary, and we have our, our team. Uh, and we've made sure to maintain the mission statement we had there, which was regarding not only helping people with this, but making sure that we advocate on behalf of the industry, that there can be some people in any industry that are some bad actors and sometimes some aggressive strategies. And our concern is, is that if people are overly aggressive, that can have damage to the entire industry. And that's when you can have legislation pop in that all of a sudden uh, harms policy holders and, and you know, clients. So we want to be very careful that you know, we're giving the right advice and hopefully educating the advisory committee or advisory community on that. I mean, I think when you talk about harm to the industry, I think about the whole uh, defined benefit to IPP rollovers issue that I think has we've had a couple layers of clampdown on that from CRA or from Department of Finance, I guess, over the years, right? And yeah, and, and it's funny because we would get a lot of calls on that. So just for those that are, are, are listening in, uh, there was a strategy that people had that if you worked for a company where you had a, you were a member of a large defined benefit pension plan and you're retiring and you're looking at your options, you know, you could take the pension from it and people had concerns about, well, after the spouse dies, it doesn't roll over to my children or my estate. And then they looked at it saying, well, if I take a commuted value, and especially if you looked at some of the government ones, two thirds of the amount was being paid out as a taxable lump sum. So in some cases they were starting a secondary business or had a viable business already. Uh, we saw it in some of the power groups where, uh, you know, they would be uh, um, retired on a Friday, hired on a contract basis on a Monday, you know, incorporate themselves. And part of what they were looking at doing is potentially moving that Find benefit plan the entire amount for them into an IPP. But the key there was you had to have an underlying business. You had to be receiving T4. You couldn't just go out and set up whatever, you know, sham ABC company for, for purposes of moving the plan over. And if you did, there could be some very strong consequences that could really damage your entire retirement strain there. So, I mean, I would say for every 50 cases that came on my desk, we maybe did one or two of them. Like there was that many of them where we just said, listen, I know why you're trying to do this, but this is not going to work out well. And there were people out there that were marketing these things and were saying, just create a company, throw some money in it, give yourself a whatever T4. And I think CRA came out with a sledgehammer on it when they, when they saw this kind of planning going on. And unfortunately, there are those that were captured in it that were legitimate cases. And now they're getting large tax bills as a result of that. Yeah, that's tough. Um, but it's a good example, I think, of that sort of give an inch, take a mile thing that, you know, and I think that's where a good conservative approach. And I, I think you said it like you, you'd see 50 cases and do one or two. Do you have a feel for what your numbers like that? Because I assume it's not much different on the IPP or RCA side. Do you have a feel for like you might you know, get X number of presentations and, and implement X number of plans? And I don't want you to give away some internal secrets. Yeah. Here. That's I mean, I would say, you know, on, on quotes that we run versus plans that we we put out, we would have a much higher rate than, let's say, a two out of 50 thing. That's just sort of a, an outlier there. And yeah. that's, just, that's just confirming, you know, also that those other 48 cases, there probably were some gray area ones where I could have tried to have been aggressive and tried to put it in place, but we didn't want to put everybody at risk for it. And the ones that don't work, you find out, you can look them up. Probably There's probably a court case somewhere in there, right? And then the last thing anybody wants is to be in court. So I think you want to be, you want to be mindful when you're doing certain things. You know, we're probably doing, I mean, at our heyday in, in 2007 through 2010, we were averaging about 350 IPPs a year. 
And then of course we had a period of time where people were dividending a lot and not T4ing much. And that sort of had things come off the rails a bit. And um, we found since 2018, when the passive income rules and the, the, what's called the COSI rules came into place, that, you know, we're probably back up to, you know, between 150 to 200 sort of. So we're definitely seeing some trending back into the direction. And I think now that in most of the provinces, I mean, I obviously am out of Toronto. So with demographics and population, we have a large number of cases here. And there were some legislative changes in Ontario in late 2020 that made these plans more flexible. There's no required funding. Um, when you wind up the plan down the road, the assets can go to an unlocked RSP and you still have that creditor proofing side. You know, there's one layer kind of removed because you're not going through the province, but there still is one because it's a registered pension plan trustee through Revenue Canada and that's written into the Income Tax Act. So uh, you're getting a lot of the flexibilities and, and you know, it was a feather in our cap that uh, the standing committee when they were debating the bill actually called um, you know, the principles of GBL up to participate on giving them an explanation as to how this benefited policy holders and, and whatnot out there. So it's important to us to be able to be on the side of being able to advocate. And there were times through the years where different finance ministers were, were putting in some things that were fairly aggressive on IPPs, and we were able to get the, the ear of the minister and go in with some of our competitors, and really be able to you know, fight the good fight for clients at the end of the day, right? And and the, and I think that if you're on the right side of 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 how you work your ethics, you get more opportunities to be able to participate in, in those types of discussions. I think if you're a little bit of a, a swindler, I don't think they're going to want to be inviting you to the party, right? So, <laughs> the fair comment. And I mean, yeah, the reputation is certainly there, and I think well earned. Um, so, yeah, you mentioned some of this in your comments about like the you know recent changes in Ontario. Can you talk about the actuary's role? I, and I'd like to break this down to sort of each stage along the process. So let's say actually placing or creating or implementing the IPP. What's the where does the actuary sit and where does the advisor sit here? Sure. I mean, basically what's happening here, and I think I alluded it to it earlier, is that the banks and, and insurance companies don't necessarily, it's not affordable for them to have actuarial staff on hand to be able to, to administer these plans. So rather than when you have an RSP and I don't know, name the firm you wanna name and you're opening up an RSP, there's always some administrative background uh, or group that is handling you know, the actual RSP tax filings and things like that. So whether that's an, a mutual fund company or or the banks or insurance companies. So because of the fact they're not administering these plans and they're not gonna to go to a great amount of expense to create things on their systems that would be unique to IPPs or RCAs, um, we utilize a trust agreement that allows the advisor to open up the account as a cash account for a trust, but it is a pension trust. So it's not like a regular trust where you know it's taxable or you could draw it down. You like there are obviously rules in place and checks and balances there. The end client is the person that we name the investment manager or the first trustee on the plan. So they will work directly with the advisor in terms of, you know, portfolio construction and you know risk tolerance. Know your client and they handle the investments. The trust that we provide it helps circumvent or helps us um, be able to be on file as the administrators of the plan. So the actuary's role really is drafting the documents, um, all the calculations. So when we run a quote for someone, they create our illustrators and all the different factors in there. Um, reviewing the documents, signing off their signature to CRA, saying that this report is correct and I'm backing it up with my e and and my credentials. And then from there, once the plan gets the approvals from the government, I mean, we're doing the annual filings. And every three years, we do something called the triannual report, where we say, okay, um, there's a seven and a half percent assumed rate of return. Where is the plan in terms of where it would need to be to be fully funded? And if it's underfunded, they can put more money in, which is deductible, or they could decide in most of the provinces now not to because of these exemptions. Um, or if it's in a surplus, there could be a contribution holiday if that surplus becomes over 25% of what is required. So 
they're, they're basically along the way being the ship captain, you know, saying, oh, you need to, you know, move this way or that way to avoid the icebergs or other things as you get to your goal. And, and so really that's a lot of what the actuary's role is. I mean, it's, you know, there's a bit of a fiduciary there in terms of making sure the calculations and everything are correct and the legal documents as well. We just dip into the triennial funding a little bit here. Sure. So, sure. so of course, I know that you have to report every three years and that's where you compare the seven and a half percent return to the return actually achieved in the plan net of fees and so forth. Mm -hmm. And um, and I don't know if you have a feeling about where fees are paid, but I know that's something some people feel strongly about. Um, but really, you can't sort of anticipate that, right? Like you can't say, well, we're only getting 4%. You really have to wait until you file that report or is that? Yeah, and there's, and there, there, there's a call. Yeah, because I mean, and you sometimes see marketing out in our industry saying, oh, the, like last year when the markets crashed, last year, the year before, I, nice. I started losing my years in COVID. When, when we started yes. this whole COVID thing, so I guess 2020, remember the markets crashed a little yes. bit after the pandemic hit. And there were people in our industry saying, hey, go out and get a valuation right now because you can throw a bunch, you know, a lot of extra money into the plan because you might need a deduction. But then, of course, the market roars back afterwards. And if you had gone and done that planning, yes, you would have paid an actuary for an additional report that you know, may not be needed. But now you've got the unintended consequence that you put the money in and the market's gone up and now you might be in a surplus and that might impede your ability to make contributions down the road. So I think it's important when you're looking at it, it is every fourth year. So after the end of every three years, we, we, we do that. And the other thing to consider is it's the seven and a half percent. It's not a straight seven and a half percent per se. Um, they have us also use a five and a half percent inflation assumption on like the RSP limits and salaries each year uh, because you know a lot of times they only list you know the RSP maximum income at the end of each year so if you have a three-year report you do have to use something to estimate what it might be in year two or three in a lot of cases so because things weren't going up at a five I mean the last couple of years we're seeing increases that are more in line with that but prior to that we didn't see that so let's say that things were only increasing at three percent well, then you're really taking the difference, you know, that that spread between now three and seven and a half percent, your real return is actually not seven and a half percent you're looking for, because some of your contributions would have been higher than they necessarily should have been. And, uh, you know, it's the devil in the details. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, you get somebody that might say, oh, I know I made exactly seven percent net of fees. Why is my plan in a surplus? Now, so depends on the time of year you funded and things like that. So there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, but the important thing there is that, you know, within an RFP or other structures, you don't have the ability to make up for market losses in your account in a tax, you know, in, in any fashion. Whereas at least with the IPP, it allows the company, if they need the deduction, um, to be able to put additional funds in to top it up to, to offset those market conditions. And we don't have, that's one of the only options we see out there where, you know, you kind of get that. I'm curious here, and maybe this is a, a question too far, but uh, do your actuaries use some, like do you have in-house software or do you do it all in Excel, uh, Abacus, what happens here? Uh, well, uh, our illustrator, so how we run our quotes and how we run our reports, it is all a series of Excel spreadsheets and, and what you find with, with actuaries, I know we talk about them as math people, but they also over time have really become computer programming people yeah. as well, right? Is there's a huge, they understand the math behind it, but they can also go in create an illustrator to do certain things. So there's sort of that side. We don't outsource that to anybody. So that's all programmed internally by our, our actuarial team. I'm sure everybody's using R or Python there, whatever the case is, right? So, <laughs> and yeah. I always say to people, if you ever hired me to be a spreadsheet guy, then you're wasting your money, right? So I'm not <laughs> an IT or, or a spreadsheet guy. So, uh, but if you want the other stuff, I, I'm, I'm pretty good at that. <laughs> Now, um, what about winding up the IPP? And you already touched on this a little bit. Like you said, what a pain it is if you set one of these up and have to shut it down early. Yeah. Um, can we talk about the sort of optimal, like I've got a business owner who ran an IPP for a number of years, and now they are really like full on retiring. Maybe, I don't know, a physician is I think a good example here. Yeah. Well, it so, really depends on what they want to do, right? Like if it's going to be, you know, with, if it's a traditional business owner, do they have kids that are in the business that are going to continue? And there can be a succession planning there that we'll touch on before the end of the podcast. Yeah. And it's important for people to really understand the nuances of that. But let's just assume that that's not the case. 
Um, what's interesting now in some of the provinces, in the provinces where we have exempt from the provincial rules, is it used to be, so exam for example, Ontario before December 2020, if I said, I'm going to start taking my pension from my IPP. So what happens is the plan stays as is, and we do the calculation on the defined benefit pension, and we say, here's how much is coming out, and they start receiving that, that, that income stream. Under the old rules, that meant you could never commute it to a, an RSP or a Lira. So if you started the pension, you were boxed in there. And you might have someone that says, I'm never selling my company in three years and gets an offer they can't refuse, right? So at that point, their only option is because the new buyer doesn't want to have it on the books, is to annuitize it. And of course, people aren't the biggest fans of annuities just because of interest rates and, and things and some of the uh, survivor benefits and whatnot. But now what we have is that in the provinces where it's not provincially regulated, you can start taking your pension and you can down the road commute it. So if it's a case where, let's say it's a very large tax liability you're looking at if we commute it. So, uh, you know, you want to think of those things. And one of the things that I talk to clients about, especially in the last few years, due to the fact that the rules that we have for IPPs were set in 1990 and, and enforced in 91. Well, seven and a half percent interest rates very different than what we've seen over the years since then. And due to the fact that our central bank has kept interest rates incredibly low, the spread between those two things creates what we call a taxable excess if you were to wind up your IPP. So let's just say you have it funded right to the dollar that we tell you to do. So it's right funded exactly where you want. When you commute it, they're having you use long-term bond benchmarks as, as, the, as the calculation of what can go over tax-free to either an RSP or a Lira. Anything over that line is payable as a taxable lump sum. So what I talk to clients is if you think termination is the way you want to go in retirement, when we start getting three to five years towards that date that you have in your mind, and we do a valuation report and we say the plan is underfunded, don't fund that deficit because that's going to eat into the taxable amount. So I think one of the problems that sometimes happens in our industry is people talk about getting in and all the wonderful things and put all this money and more money and more money and more money. But if that then creates an unintended consequence of the tax liability due to the other planning, and that's why I think it's very important when we're talking to advisors and clients to understand that, you know, this is great for these things. We don't want to have it where it gets too out of control in terms of the, the winding it up down the road. So the annuity. So, OK, so that's good. You've you've covered off the like transfer to Lira, transfer to RSP. I want to circle back to the annuity now for a moment. Sure. So and I I agree. And we've had some discussions about annuities on the podcast before and you know, sort of a mixed bag out there. But is there so it's literally like if I'm going to just stick with the IPP and I'm going to just retire. I'm going to yeah. like not make any changes. Is it literally that my only choice here is to buy an annuity from like an insurer or can I essentially treat this like a defined benefit pension plan and it pays out an income yeah. that's roughly based on that model? It will exactly. So when we're showing quotes to clients, we have really, there's three options, but we're only showing the two. And the first one is you just take your pension directly from the IPP. It stays okay. intact. It has to still be connected to the company um, because like I said, funding's not enforced. You know, you don't have to top it up. Um, there obviously would still be our fees and calculations and they just receive an annual income stream from it. Um, we only really see the annuity in cases where there's not gonna be a company anymore and maybe there's a really sizable tax liability. So let's say we go the RSP route it's half a million that's going to be taxed and at the their their top you know at their at their average tax rate and you know they're sitting they're going to lose half of it let's say along the way well then someone might say okay the fact i don't have the survivor side on the annuity and let's just say i'm not doing these back to backs or the things where you're you know where you're throwing a uh, you know an insurance policy against that side um you know, then you might look at it and say, okay, if I'm balancing this risk with the tax risk, then perhaps I do the annuity and what you do. And I know they refer to them as copycat annuities often out there. All it is is an annuity that mimics the pension that we have in often one. So you're getting the same pension you would have got. You are going to probably have to throw a lot more money into it to be able to, because you know, they're guaranteeing you that income stream. So 
um, you're probably going to have to put a lot in, but then again, that's deductible as well. Would it be you going to insurers and talking about the annuity product or is that on the advisor? It's usually on the advisor side. We work with them and we say, okay, here's what we have. And now we need to go to, you know, if you're going to go shop it and we can assist you with, you know, talking to the insurer about it, but basically you're trying to get a pension that mirrors what we have there. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you find, I always wonder about this with that copycat and like, do, do insurers actually, are they willing to work with you on that? Or do you find that it's a, it's a little bit like pulling teeth? Well, it's interesting. I don't know out of the number of plans we have, how many actually annuitize. It's a pretty small number, right? And then, yeah. but we've always found that the insurance companies would work with us because what we're doing is all, I mean, they're just trying to get an annuity that matches a pension that's already approved by CRA. So it's not like we're doing anything that's really outside the box per se. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Now you mentioned, and I love this concept phrase. I'm a big fan of this, this sort of multi-generational or, you know, when you know you have the kids working in the business and maybe, you know, you and I both have this in common, Fraser, right? We're both sort of in family businesses here. Um, so can you chat a little bit about the 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 benefits or the where it fits for yep. the kind of multi-generational? Sure. And I mean, we've seen a lot of this out in, you know, in play, you know, you've got a, small business mom and dad have operated for 30 years they're in their late 60s they're approaching retirement there's a lot of money built into the business and the important thing here is okay you've got children of the next generation on the payroll but the key here is, is that one of those kids is at least is earmarked for succession so we want to have it not just and i've seen it out there where people will say just throw junior on the payroll, even though they have nothing to do with the company. And the whole idea is so we can roll this pension down and we're going to avoid all this tax and whatnot. And the key there is, so let's just take an example. So mom and dad have an IPP. They've got $2 million remaining in it. And unfortunately, a car accident, they won't pass away. If we don't have them within the plan, and let's just say the children are named in equal shares as the beneficiaries on the plan. What would happen there is they will each receive their portion. So if there's three kids, a third each, and they're going to be taxed on it. So there's obviously going to be a large tax liability that occurs. And if not, the kids would be in the estate. However, if we have the kids in the business and we know the business isn't going to be sold or wound up upon death of the parents, that $2 million now rolls down to those three kids that are employed by the company. They have a contribution holiday because the plan has way more money or in a surplus as we refer to it. So there's a lot more money in there than they have pension service to like, it's almost like bread soaking up liquid, you know, in a sense, if you have a sauce or something, right? So you don't have enough bread there to soak up the sauce. And the way that you need to deal with that is to earn T4 down the road to earn credits to whittle that down over time. So if you just threw Junior on the payroll, mom and dad die and the company's collapsed or sold, well, all that money that, that, that is in there in a surplus is going to pop right out taxable to them when we wind up the plan. So you really haven't done anything to move the needle there. Um, you know, the kids have had some use of the IPP, but I mean, at the end of the day, for that to work on succession planning, like, or the roll down, there does have to be a clear succession. And we have clients where it's worked incredibly well. So you must see that in some farming families, Freeze. I know you're in Toronto, but... Uh... Yeah, we've done it. We've done it with farming families. We've done it with... Um, just you know, mom and pop businesses that were in multiple generations, maybe cleaning businesses, big business cleaning businesses and things like that. Like there's a lot of different areas that we've worked in with this. And, uh, it could be an interesting planning tool if the right circumstances are there. So, you know, and, and you say this well, I think, where you say we're, we're going to make sure that this is a business that's really going to be like that corporation is going to exist for the long haul. Yeah. Right. That's I think that's key here. Um, so what about the role of say hold codes here? Can you chat about that at all? Sure. Uh, you could, I mean, we have seen scenarios where someone's got opco hold code, they're selling the shares of opco. They don't want to collapse the IPP. Perhaps hold has got a bunch of investments in it or real estate or other things where you could say, okay, could I draw a T4 at a one time or a couple year basis, a small one to create an employment relationship between myself and the company. I could justify that amount if it's a certain amount saying, well, you know, this is payment for managing all these aspects of the business through the years. At that point, we could add the IPP. That company is a sponsor. Uh, company A, Opco, 
funds up to whatever it's a, its requirement is to that date. We take it off the books and then company B or hold co sponsors the plan. If there's no future T4, there's no contributions. It could just sit intact or they could start taking the pension depending on their age. Or if they started another opco down the road, they could even move the sponsor over to that over time. And that's, is that really just filing with CRA to say like- Yeah, this it's a, yeah. you need to put in a new valuation report because we're adding another company that we're calculating service and you're always still, you know, so it's cleaner if we could do it on a, on a valuation year because we've already priced that in, uh, but we could do it in a non-valuation year if they need to, it's just there's additional cost for, for a new report. So have you had a case where, um, you know, you sit down with business owner, like age 50, and you ask the question, is there any prospect for sale of the business? And the business owner says, no, I'm going to work until I die in the chair, that kind of thing. And then, you know, three or four years later, the business owner actually does, they get an offer that they can't refuse. Yeah. And uh, now they they sell. And maybe this time you don't have that sort of hold cost structure you just talked about. What happens there? Well, and that's, and, and so are we looking at a case where they have an IPP? Are they taking the pension at this point or is it intact? Like what? Uh, Let's go what, with intact. So they're still okay. funding it. They haven't started. So at that point, they could, if they have no other company to move it to, they would either um, commute it to an RSP or, or Lira, depending on the province, and you know, deal with the tax liability there, or they would purchase an annuity to mimic the pension. So you, once you once you uh, divest yourself of ten percent, like you're under ten percent shares of the company, you're what we call non-connected. So when I'm talking about IPPs and flexibilities and all these great bells and whistles, I'm talking about owner manager connected plans. So either I own ten percent or more shares of the company, or my spouse does, or my parents or my kids do. There has to be a level where you're not in an arms like situation. And what's your once your shares get below that level, the buyer is not going to want to have the liability on their books because now the government's treating it as if it's an arms like employer plan and they want to make sure that thing is fully funded before that person retires because they feel even if the employee says, I'm going to waive that, their feeling is you're shortchanging an employee. So this is why it's very important that you want to either have another company to move it to or do something with it. And often, you know, we hear about this after they've, you know, it's the plan we have going and they tell us about the sale after the fact that we can backdate. Like it's not too far into the future, we can backdate the report to reflect that. Okay. So still a little, like not ideal, I guess, right? When you yeah. have that, uh, yeah. But, and I mean, that's why it's so important that the advisor knows their client. You don't want to set this up where, where there's a strong possibility of that, that sale happening. Fairly yeah, soon. like I said, I've seen, like you said, I've seen cases where there was really no indication of long term, like, you know, where, where they were going to sell the company and it literally just came out of the blue and an offer that they thought was good enough. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. OK, um, so that's a lot on the IPP. Is there anything else we should chat about there? I appreciate you. You go into a lot of detail there. I, hey, no problem. I mean, yeah. I'm you know, happy to do that. And, I, and like I said, I think it's important when you're looking at this and you're sitting down is. You want to look at all the different like angles on it. Like what is the company's cash flow? Like and and what I find in, you know, even when we're talking about IPPs and RCAs, is the majority of the RCAs I've done through the years, it was a conversation that started out about IPPs. And there was some reason when that discussion and that investigation as to why the RCA was a better vehicle than the IPP or vice versa. Like uh I think that, like I said, I, I don't want to be hokey about it, but I look at these as, as strategies. And if the strategy doesn't work, what's the point of doing it? Like, it's, it's just, it's going to irritate the client. And then they're going to tell people they know, oh, never do an IPP. It was a mess. It just cost me a lot of money. Advisors are going to be mad because it's a headache. And then really for us to set things up and then wind them out down a year or two later, the amount of work that goes into it, it's really not that viable for us from a profit perspective. So it, well, it's like everybody yeah. loses there, right? Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm guessing you only really make money where you have a client for, you know, decades plus kind of thing. Like that's... Well, we, we priced out... So we have a flat fee platform and it's interesting when we put this in play a bit over 10 years ago, um, almost to what I think there may have been one firm out there that was doing something similarly. And what we had done is we just 
looked at the fees over a life average life. What was the average life of our plans? What were the fees over that period of time? Divided by the number of years and flatted it. You know, and and uh, you know uh, what. Uh, you know, have it, uh, you know, up or down uh, to, to, to the exact dollar to be rounding it up or down. Um, so that's what we did at the time. So yeah, if you're having it and you're saying, okay, your average lifespan is eight to 10 years and you're, most of the plans you're doing are three to four years of age, like you're losing kind of money along the way you priced it in. Yeah, absolutely. So now this seems like a good transition to the RCA is that a lot of times people start thinking IPP is going to be the solution, but it turns out that there's actually an RCA opportunity there. Yep. Um, and do you find that most of the RCAs you're doing are for the owner operator of the business? It's interesting. One of the things that happened with RCAs over the last while, and, and I have to state it, if anyone's ever in one of my presentations, I usually lead off my RCA section with saying, the RCA is one of the most misunderstood planning structures out there in Canada. And part of the reason for that is when they were first in vogue, they were really marketed around life insurance policies. And a lot of people were looking at it saying, you can have a split dollar universal life policy where the cash value is owned by the RCA, you split out the death benefit owned by the company. And what we found a lot of times was the client was doing the RCA because they needed it. They had a tax need. They didn't necessarily need the policy at that point. And I think with a lot of the planning these days with passive assets, most business owners are, are fairly heavily insured up these days as it is, right? Like there's a lot of reasons you want to have life insurance owned within your corporation. The justification of doing that on the RCA side was within an RCA investment account, if you have any realized capital gains, dividends, or interest, 50% of those amounts have to be remitted to this government account each year. So a lot of people are focusing on tax efficiency. So, you know, you're growing on an exempt policy, you're growing tax deferred on that. So it does fit the tax side. However, life insurance is also predicated on funding over a certain period of time. So you might have someone that only needed that one de deduction and don't necessarily need to fund this thing over the next 10 years, let's say or something comes up in their company and they need to cash in the policy and their surrender charges. And you, so you can achieve the same goals by using other things like corporate class funds and, and things like that, where you're fairly close to the tax efficiency side. So that was part of it where I think some people had their backs up saying, well, you know, it, it, was, it was marketed that way. And also we had a period of time where, you know, the top marginal tax rate was below 50%. And so for those that aren't aware of RCAs, uh, one of the, the 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 main downside of an RCA is when you contribute to it, half your contribution goes to a trust where it's invested, and the other half goes to a government account called a refundable tax account where it sits in escrow and grows at a zero percent interest rate. So people are looking at it saying, you know, like half my money's not growing, this plan doesn't make a lot of sense. But now that we have tax rates north of fifty percent, um, you actually, if you were going to be paid the top marginal tax rate, so I always say to people, what would happen with this money if you didn't make the contribution? And if you're saying to me it's going to hit a 53% tax rate, let's say in Ontario, well, you actually have more sense of the dollar invested in the RCA than you do on an after-tax basis. And when the RCA works really well is the ability that I could say, could I smooth my income out and, and push other things aside for a period of time in my retirement where this money that would have paid at a higher tax bracket, I'm going to break it down a couple um, you know, brackets from there. I'll, I'll give you an example that we use, a uh, severance example. So we've got an executive, uh, works for a company, they're pulling their Canadian operations out. They go to him November of the year and say, listen, we're winding up the business by the end of the year. We're going to pay you out of severance, which is equal to 18 months uh, earnings. The guy earns a quarter of a million dollars. He's already in the top marginal tax rate because of the time of year we're at. And he says, okay, like I'm going to get shredded on the tax, right? And if you look at it and, and you take the top marginal tax rate on 375,000, I think it was about 174, 173,000 is what they're going to net after they pay the taxes. Well, let's just say, for example, this executive is going to retire. Their income needs are $125,000 a year uh, pre-tax. We put the three seventy-five dollars into the RCA, half and half between the two accounts. Let's just assume that there's no interest whatsoever, so there's no growth whatsoever in the account. It's cash. 
Over the next three years, he's going to push others' income aside. We're going to take $125,000 a year in three equal payments for the three years after the severance has occurred. We've dropped their tax rate in Ontario to 28% from 53%. So, you know, you basically have a 25% spread there. Uh, you save about $95,000 in taxes just by taking that and splitting it at three. And I think sometimes the misconception with, with RCAs is, I have to be a hockey player or a multi-million dollar person who's going to retire in the Grand Cayman Islands or somewhere where there's a better tax treaty. And unless I'm doing that, I'm staying in Ontario or Alberta or BC, and I'm always going to pay a certain tax rate. So there's no point in this whatsoever. And what I'm trying to say is there are a lot of cases, especially in the executive or employee side, where we could turn something, you know, if you could have $95,000 more in your pocket, and let's just say after all fees and everything, let's say it was only 85, just for argument's sake. Every dollar when you're at a certain point in retirement is very important to you. And that's a significant amount of money to make you think, well, maybe in the negotiation, I could say, well, what if instead we, we did this as a retirement payment? And if we could pay for it that way, we could avoid what we call a salary deferral arrangement, which CRA says is a no-no. And because we, we want to make sure, you know, and I think it's important for, for us because we like to see regular Canadians have more money in their pocket when they retire. And really when BBL was set up all those years ago, the whole idea was working with small business owners and corporate professionals and employees and how can we find ways to help them do a lot of different planning in a tax efficient manner. So going back to this, I like this case study, by the way, it's a great case study. So you've got this senior executive, this person gets this big chunk, they go to the, and of course the employer has to be involved. The employer is gonna yeah, have- Yeah, they to, have to agree to set it up and, and, and whatnot. <clears throat> and, and the employee has to be willing to kind of push that too, right? That's, uh, I, yep. yeah, we had a previous guest on the podcast who had one of these and the employee would have been well served by the RCA, but actually wasn't willing to ask for what that employee considered special treatment. So yeah. yeah. Um, so the that let's say now that person does that they you know all the pieces fall into place and they get that money deposited into the RCA in November of let's say 2022 yeah and now in 2023 uh, they get a job offer they get you know some competitor says oh we, you know, that guy's yeah. available now we're going to scoop him up and pay him a quarter million dollars a year so what happens with the RCA can you just push push it down the road now? Is that okay? Yeah. I mean, the nice thing about RCAs is first off, unlike an IPP where we'd said, you know, you have to have a company attached to it. Yeah. We can, at that point, once the company has funded its obligation, we can take the company off and essentially the trustees continue the RCA. So it can stay intact. You can delay taking money to whatever point in time you want. And I've even seen in cases like that where they got really excited about RCAs after, which was something they didn't know about before we did this. And sometimes they might talk to that person hiring them saying, listen, I want, I have an RCA. I want to move it over and let's a uh, yeah, quarter of a million dollars is great. We're negotiating it. Yeah. How about you're going to pay me 200,000 and 50,000 is going to be a contribution to my RCA on my behalf. So not only can you keep it in, in, in stasis almost, I mean, but you can also see if that's something that a, a new employer might like. And what we found is, because of the fact tax rates are where they are, a lot of executives get a bonus and they're kind of ho hub about it because they see how much tax they're paying and they're looking for deferral opportunities. But it becomes a lot more complicated if you don't have already in their contracts the ability to contribute to this. Like you can't just tear up the contract and the next day say, we're going to change your pay in this way specifically yeah. without properly putting a, you know, a, a senior exec executive retirement plan or something like that in place where you're you're qualifying why this is, is going in and you really need to then be doing it for the whole group not just on a one-off basis so part of what we're doing these days is educating through the advisors they might do you know the group benefits for a company and they got the ear of the owner this is where we get a lot of these and you know it's like i really want to do something i you know i'm having turnover i really want to have the best of the best and tie them to the company for a while um, and they say, what What are your options? And, and the RCA is one of the only things where you can build in some pretty strong uh, vesting provisions into it as to the way you want to have that. So maybe they have to say 10 years to get any of it to vest, or maybe it's staged over time. 
And uh, what we found is like the RC is one of the only structures out there that allows you to go with a more um, aggressive vesting provisions that you know DPSPs and obviously RFPs and things like that don't allow for. So it's really a tool that people aren't aware of. And I mean, if we can put it together as a program, new hires, you know, love this sort of thing because they can see that they're putting money aside right there and it doesn't impact their RSP room. So they can still do their RSPs on top of that. And if you're making a quarter million dollars, you're probably maxed out on RSP or some like DPSP or whatever somewhere, right? So sure. And if you're an advisor that has the group RSPs for people, you might be looking at this saying, okay, do you have an executive group that's making, you know, much higher than the limits? What if we looked at at, a, at an RCA program stacked on top of the the group RSP? So uh, when you're already someone's already your client and you're doing these different type of, of planning strategies, you might already have opportunities to put something that in place that you're just not aware of. And yeah, and I've seen an attempt to use like a stock matching plan, stock purchase plan, yeah. phantom stock plans in there. And I find all of those things end up way more, especially if you're dealing with an owner operator who is like a hundred or near a hundred percent, those things are way more complicated than what you might want to get into as that owner operator. Yeah. And it's interesting. Like we have, we have a few different clients where over the years there was M and A activity and, you know, we may have had RCA for this one company and another company bought them and they already had a very complicated plan that one of the large you know, uber large consulting firms we know in the in the country, I don't need to name names, as set up for them. And it's interesting because I, I there's times where I'm sitting there with the HR person and they're they're trying and they're looking at this and they're like, we don't understand this plan. Like they understand our plan, but they say every time I have to go annually to look at this, it actually causes me stress. So when I we're sitting down and we're doing proposals on whether it's group RCAs or individual ones, or we could bring uh, uh, some lawyers that we have as partners to draft a a, a SERP agreement, and then we use the RC as the funding vehicle, uh, is I look at it saying, I want the HR department not to understand what we're doing, what the planning is there that we're doing. I don't want the person to look at this and go, oh my God, this is such a pain in the neck. Every time I see this, it causes a stress. So I think it's very important, um, I don't know, to keep things simple and straightforward and not, you know, you know, we can come up with convoluted, but if nobody understands it, what's the point of it almost, I think. Yeah, and I find um, for the most part, when I teach the RCA in class, advisors come into it not really understanding, but in the end, you're like 50%. If you just know that number 50%, that covers like almost everything the advisor has to know about the RCA. It's, it's not that complicated a plan once it's in place. But it's getting people over the idea of, and it's one of the interesting things that I noticed and, and maybe having a, an undergraduate psych degree years ago is helpful in other things is noticing the psychology of clients. And, and just from not only when I worked in, when I worked in brokerage, we had a lot of clients back then when Nortel was trading over a hundred bucks is right when it melted down. And we had a lot of pensioners calling in every day and they'd ask for the price. And you know, it was a rollout from when they had Bell stock. So for those that don't know, Nortel was split off from Bell. So if you had Bell stock from years and years and years, you probably ended up with some Nortel shares and there was no adjusted cost base practically. So when you sell it, it's almost all taxable. Well, you know, we would say to them, maybe you should take some of this off the table. And they're like, we don't want to pay the tax. We don't want to pay the tax. And they just followed it all the way down to basically nothing where you're not paying tax now. And I find for clients taxes are almost the biggest loss to people at a time. Like I know we talk about fees, we talk about investment losses, but I find taxes hit people harder. Like they look at it more so. So when people are looking at this, they're saying half your money's taxed and you've given it away, but that's not the case. And it's, can you find ways when you're drawing down the money that you're paying less than a 50% tax rate? And, and so it's not lost, but you get this thing in people's head that, Half of it's with the government, so it's gone forever. And I think educating people and getting and showing examples that can that are real life examples that where you can see the benefit, I think that that's you know that's a big part of what we're doing in the education side. So I have another technical question around the RCA here. So the death of the RCA plan member. Yeah. Can you talk about this a little bit and 
what I'm really thinking here primarily is the, and I have other questions, but the plan member who dies with money still in that refundable account. Yeah. So refundable tax is never, is never caught or it's never stuck. Um, what would happen there is if they have a surviving spouse, they could draw the money out either lump sum or they could draw it out over time. So there's no requirement to collapse it unless okay. whoever designed the, the RCA put that in there, right? Because, because when you look at an RCA compared to, let's say, a pension plan or an RSP, there's entire sections of the Income Tax Act that talk about what happens on retirement and taxability, all these things. If you look up the RCA and the Income Tax Act, you'll say you are an RCA if you're not one of these things, and it's 13 to 17 different structures you need. And then they talk about salary deferral arrangements, but there's no discussion around age of drawing it down, when you have to draw it down. Like there's no defined rules like you have with RSPs and, and pension plans. So you can defer taking the money throughout your lifetime if you didn't need access to it. And your spouse can then draw it out over time. And if the spouse dies, the kids can draw it out either in equal shares or or over time, like either lump sum or equal shares over time. So you do have a little bit of an ability to manage the tax liability compared to an RSP. That assumes that you wrote that into the like, okay, because I saw yeah. one once where it was a publicly traded company and the RCA would have been set up by one of the aforementioned uh, big consulting firms. Yeah. And at least now I never got to see the document. So maybe this is wrong, but what I was told was that the RCA had to be collapsed on the death of that executive. Yeah, that's obviously, and, and I mean, part of that is probably because they're managing it on a group basis where we can parse it out. So right. let's say we're doing it for a company with a bunch of employees and somebody retires and they hit their vesting and they say, listen, I want to take my plan with me. I want my own advisor managing the assets. I just, you know, Closing the chapter with the company, right? Right. Um, they have the ability. There's a portability side to it, right? They just pay the annual tax fees, and we just we just take off the company, and the trustees continue it, right? So you do have that portability, at, at, you know, um, side as well as long as it's in the document. But I tell you, Jason, I've seen I've seen weird ones. I saw one where they said you had to um, annuitize it, which means you're collapsing it, you're paying the tax. And you're taking the after-tax amount and you're buying an annuity. And I thought that's got to be one of the, the, the stupid, like, as an employee, why would I even want that plan, right? Like, yeah. And you so can't buy an annuity within the RCA. Like, that's, no, that's you, yeah, because we have the refundable tax, too, you got to think of, right? Yeah. So um, huh. it's interesting when you see some of that stuff. So we try to keep it as flexible as possible. However, when we're sitting down with companies, they may have certain wishes that they want. And because the documents are malleable to a certain degree, we can build these certain things in. So if they wanted to do that, we could, we just don't see the benefit to it, obviously. All right, I'm gonna try my question too far again here, although you were good with the last one. So what about US persons in the RCA, any concerns there? Your main concern is, you know, it's funny, we used to always say the IRA or the CRA was the, was the worst one compared to the IRS, but the IRS is all pretty wacky. So. The IRS views um, IPPs or RSPs as pension plans in the sense of that they are deferred, um, they're not considered taxable on, as worldwide income for US citizens. The RCA, however, they don't recognize in that sense. So where you have to be careful, and like we see, we see with athletes, I mean, there used to be NBA player RCAs until they changed it a few collective bargaining agreements ago, unfortunately, and I'm a big Raptors fan, so that was not not you know, you get to go in the dressing room yeah um and i know like like uh we see them obviously with hockey players uh, and we see a lot with the baseball players as well and the key there is is that you want to have whatever you're putting into the plan depending on what the tax rate would be here you have to look at the spreads between the tax rates between canada and the u.s and i think if you're between the tax credits and there's a certain amount of a spread you can make that amount without having to worry about remitting any tax to CR or to the IRS. But I think if you get over that level, they will treat it as taxable worldwide income and you might have to do remittances. But one of the things with the US that's interesting is if you're gonna to retire to the US to a state with no state tax, when you're drawing down your RCA, it could be anywhere between 25% tax you pay or 15% depending on whether, like it's 15, if you draw it out over 10 years or more, I think it's 15%. Um, it's 25% on a lump sum basis. 
Yeah, it is. Uh, it's just it's always that additional layer of complexity, right? The U.S. And, versus, and that's why we always say because I mean, if we're dealing with the U.S. citizen, they obviously have a tax professional helping on that. Or if they don't, well, we've got a very wide Rolodex that we can give them names. But you know, I'll always say, okay, here's how this works on a rudimentary basis, but we need your your tax professional to opine on yeah. the actual impact of that. But we'll point it out, and they usually know what to do with that. That yeah, makes sense. All right, um, so we've covered IPP and RCA. Do you have any last comments on RCAs, uh, Fraser? <clears throat> Just, I think that it's, it, I don't think being dismissive on them. And like I said, it's really a matter of saying, if I didn't do this, what's behind, uh, you know, what's behind door number two? And I think that, you know, educating people is important. Um, a couple of things I just want to mention while we are on here as well is, I mean, yeah. we are known for different things in different circles. Uh, one of the, the things that we did a ton of work with and uh, unfortunately, 2016, there were some legislative changes, is fair market value of life insurance, yep. where you're valuing a life insurance policy. And when we go back to what you were saying earlier about people selling their companies and you have an IPP, well, what do you do? I find most of the time advisors and accountants, you know, the, the transaction's going through and they haven't thought about this life insurance policy. And now they find out, what do I do with this? And knowing that when you're transferring it between entities, there can be a tax, taxable consequence to that. And it's not the cash surrender value you're looking at, but it's actually what we call the fair market value. So you need to have an actuary to calculate that amount saying, I've had this policy for 10 years. Um, premiums have gone up over time. I'm older. Maybe my health has changed. To get a similar policy now would obviously be more expensive than that policy at the time. So that can factor in a value that CRA wants to see. So if I'm transferring it from corp to corp, it's a dividend between the corporations. If I'm transferring it to me personally and it's non-arm's length, whatever that fair market value is, that's gonna be taxable to me, like unless I give them equal consideration for it. Um, so that's something that people don't think of and the number of times we get accountants or, or advisors calling us saying, this transaction closed, we didn't know about this and we need this by yesterday. Like, it's, so it's an important consideration if your client as advisors, even if you're not reaching out to us, if they you they tell you we're selling your business and you know there's insurance in there, you really should try to have a discussion on that sooner than later. Yeah. And the other final area with that that I so what it used to be before 2016 is you could flip it from personal to corp and you could actually draw um, money out. The fair market value wasn't taxable and they 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 did away with that. But the one area where there, there, there can be an interesting play on it is charitable gifting. So, for example, in Toronto, we've got very strong relationships with a few of the hospitals. Um, one of them uh, does have us as the exclusive, like they will only use our valuations because their auditors are comfortable with it. So I'll give you an example. We've got 60 year old who's got a T10 term 10 life insurance policy. It's on the second renewal or third renewal. It's, it's near the end. It, it's coming up for renewal. It's going to be really expensive to renew it. They don't really care that much about the insurance at this point. You know, they could convert it, but then they're looking at the cost of that. And let's just say their health has changed from the time that they took out the policy. So maybe they had a heart attack or maybe they have type 2 diabetes, to give you an example. Although that is a term policy and you'd say it should have a value of zero, the conversion option on it does have a value associated with it. So if we've got an impaired life, we could take a million dollar policy that you might think is worth zero. And let's say in this case, it's all of a sudden a fair value of 200 grand because we say they have a 300% rating and those so their life expectancy is shortening greatly. Some of the charities out there, if the internal rate of return is high enough, so the life expectancy is, is fairly you know, short, they will take the policy on, uh, they will provide a, a, a tax receipt for the fair market value. So now we have a scenario where we had a policy that was gonna lapse, worthless, clients getting something for it as a tax receipt and feels good that they've given to a charity that they care about. So there's a philanthropic angle obviously to it. The advisor stays the advisor record. So although the, you're transferring the policy to the charity, the charity is still gonna keep the same insurance advisor they now are going to have a sale on the conversion. So it's converted to permanent <clears throat> and the insurance company is going to pay, or the not the charity is going to pay the premiums for the rest of the life of the policy because they said it fits within our internal rate of return that we feel it's a fair investment. So you've taken something that really would have been worthless and all of a sudden we've made you know 
a huge opportunity for all parties. And I think that's something we don't always look at when we're looking at insurance and uh, those other needs. Yeah. And I like that strategy, you know, that idea that, and, and I agree that we would normally sort of assume uh, zero fair market value for term, but there's plenty of precedent for that not to be true. So yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. I, and I do want to get you back on Fraser. We'll definitely schedule a part two to delve into some of these life insurance concepts a little more because I find, and especially post 2016 now, there's kind of a different world with these insurance transfers. So. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, there's a lot of things to consider there and then, yeah, we're more than happy to uh, come <laughs> back. Thank you very much for yeah. uh, inviting me onto the podcast. Uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity. I really uh, love your willingness, Fraser, to, to get right into the nuts and bolts. That's, uh, that's brave in a sort of, uh, and I, I mean, I know, you're, you know your subject matter very well, but, uh, you know, brave sort of ad hoc or off the cuff like that. So thanks well, so much. I think it's important, you know, to be, you know, to be honest and organic with what you're doing, right? Like, yeah. I mean, you know, I can I delve right into it because I don't have a script running through my head. <laughs> Find me perfect. up and let me go. Right. What we see is what we get, right? There you go. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Fraser. Enjoy the rest of your day. Um, you have snow out there, I guess, today. Eh? Today is uh... Yeah, it literally is up to past my, my, my knees. I haven't seen that. When we first moved into this house 13 years ago, the first winter, I only used a broom. Okay, so, yeah. Probably. We've had the same here in Edmonton. We've had an unusual amount of snow this winter, but nothing like what I see falling on Toronto today. Well, and you know, here we get a few snowflakes and people don't know how to drive on a good day. So yeah, any, anybody out there, hopefully they're at home and not, not out trying good to luck. deal with it. So, yeah. Perfect. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, as I said, lots there. Um, Fraser was not shy about getting into some of the details and going through case studies, which I thought was really great. The number for today's episode is two. The number for today's episode is two. And if you could join me again in two weeks, uh, we're going back to the investment well on this one. I'm going to have actually a little bit of overlap here, I suspect, with uh, Russ Sawatsky, who was our last interview. We're going to hear from an advisor who mostly works with clients uh, coming from either a DIY background or an advice only uh, background, but uh, I think more of a focused, let's say, look at investments here, whereas Russ was really um, looking at the financial planning side. So again, join us in uh, two weeks time, and I look forward to that interview very much. I think I'll learn some things there. Enjoy your continued studies. Thanks for watching. Use the link in the description down below to join our CE program. With many of our videos, subscribers can do a short quiz for CE credits, and you'll have access to our full library of content.